So I'm going to let people come in for a minute or so, then we're going to begin. Welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is a platform for CMU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing and emerging issues we're all facing now. Let us know if you'd like to hear about something or from someone and we'll try to line it up. Today we have an author's forum, which is a series within On the Park Bench discussing recently published books by urbanists and or of interest to urbanists. The author's forum is produced by Duru Tadani, architect and urbanist who works behind the scenes to put this together. Thank you, Duru. Today's author's forum is a history of street networks from grids to sprawl and beyond with author Lawrence Auerbach and the discussion with Andreas Duwani, Norman Garrick, Paul Crabtree, Rick Hall, and Douglas Duwani. Share your thoughts, hashtag on the park bench, www.tinyurl.com slash OTPB feedback and register for our next webinar Tuesday, May 4th, Columbus Downtown Development Corporation Parks Proving Their Worth. Join us as a panel discusses the role parks will play in the future of wellness, development, and community in our cities. See, go to cnu.org slash resources slash on the park bench hyphens in between. And I wanted to remind everybody of CNU 29 Design for Change, our 29th Congress for the New Urbanism coming up May 19th through 21st, and it's gonna focus on the interaction of design and power. The power design holds to influence the way we live, to physically change and adapt the spaces we inhabit, as, how, as well as how we can use it to achieve the change we want to see in neighborhoods, towns, cities, and across regions. The CMU 29 program is gonna break the mold of previous Congresses with multiple formats that maximize the benefits of the virtual Congress and encourage creativity and innovation from participants. Learn more at cmu.org slash cmu29. We've got a great discussion today uh, with author um, Lawrence Auerbach, uh, a history of street networks from grids to sprawl and beyond. He is an independent writer and editor specializing in urban design and sustainable transportation. He's been involved in the new urbanism and smart growth for two decades, working on a variety of topics, including project evaluation, street networks, and green urbanism. He wrote the TND design rating standards listed in the EPA comp compilation of smart growth scorecards and served on the review panel for EPA's award for smart growth achievement several times. He contributed to the books the Language of Towns and Cities, 2012, and the Charter of the New Urbanism, second edition, 2013. Lawrence helped to write portions of the lead for neighborhood development rating system and has written many important blog essays. He served on the boards of the Institute for Architecture and Art, Mid-Atlantic Chapter, and the Congress for the New Urbanism, DC Chapter. We've got a great panel today. I'm gonna to make these introductions brief. Uh, because we have a lot to get to, but Andrew of DPZ Co-Design, Norman Garrick, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, University of Connecticut, Paul Crabtree of Crabtree Group, Inc., and Rick Hall of Hall Planning and Engineering, not pictured, it's Douglas Duwani, uh, Landscape Architect. And I'm Rob Studeville with CNU, editor of CMU's online journal, Public Square, and senior communications advisor. A history of street networks from grids to sprawl and beyond. 
explores the origins and institutionalization of modern roadway networks, particularly the networks of urban sprawl. The book surveys an international history of these powerful yet unheralded infrastructure systems. Now, um, we're going to get, uh, I'm going to give a, a brief uh, uh, discussion of the structure of this webinar today. Uh, we're going to start with a uh, uh, with a description of the book by Andreas Duani, and um, uh, then move on to a presentation by uh, the author Lawrence Auerbach, uh, who's going to uh, talk and explore about some of the uh, some some of the uh, uh, um, material from the book, and then we're going to have a panel discussion from our excellent panel today, uh, uh, mostly a panel of engineers, uh, with the exception of Andreas who's a, an architect and, and uh, um, an urbanist, and um, Douglas, who's a landscape architect. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. And I'm going to uh, now stop. Oh, yeah, I should mention that uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to have Q&A from the audience, but uh, it's going to take a little bit longer today to get to that Q&A uh, because of the, uh, the panel discussion that we have, but we will get to that uh, probably after the hour point. Um, so please ask your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom uh, as they occur to you, and, and we'll get to them. I am stopping sharing my screen and Andreas, you can take over. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Oh, okay, uh, so um, uh, we had a little chat before this began and Lawrence uh, basically said that he was bracing himself for me to say something controversial, <laughs> which is absolutely to be expected. Well, uh, the only controversial thing that I'm gonna say today is that I am such an extravagant admirer of this book that it's almost unbelievable. And uh, I may actually spoil it for everyone else by um, not allowing or perhaps not, not creating a space for criticism. So when this book arrived, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, I've known Lawrence for a very long time and I know he has been a very, very important player in the background, uh, a great team player, and behind um, actually so many of the most important initiatives of the new urbanism. He's there and he's making them better and uh, doing really steady and I think very, very polished work. Uh, when this book arrived and I saw it and I said, well, one more brilliant book by another brilliant new urbanist. I've got about a dozen, you know, um, I don't know, I've got, I've got dozens of books. Um, by new urbanists, uh, just Emily Taylor writes one a year. And I was thinking, well, here's one more, uh, great. And then I, uh, I put it aside and I began looking at it. And uh, wherever my eyes landed, I was just extravagantly impressed with what I saw. And I'd like what I read and what I saw. And I'd like to just say a few things and position it in what, where this book sits in, I think, the, the, uh, uh, the discourse of urbanism. The first is that it is absolutely comprehensive. It really, it begins with Michelangelo and it ends yesterday with, uh, you know, the, the very, the, la the, the, the last words are about EV vehicles of the small kind, the micro vehicles, which are exactly what I'm talking about, what I've been talking about this week. So it's very comprehensive. And uh, uh, the second thing about its comprehensiveness is that it pulls together. I have a pretty good shelf on what I consider the history of uh, not just uh, you know, traffic, uh, but actually uh, public space. It is in fact what uh, streets are the public space of America, streets are the public spaces of most cities. I think squares and plazas and, and, and parks get too much credit. They're a tiny percentage of the public space and the streets are the public space. And if engineers knew that they were actually the designers of the public space of America, they would actually have, um, I think it would, it would just attract the best minds. Um, 
It isn't just about doing something that's akin to plumbing and doing black box calculations. It's actually the design of the public space of America. This brings up one more thing, which is about our, tra our engineers, the four that are here, the other four that we, we all know about. They are very special because they're generalists. Most engineers know only one thing. This is the dimension that the book says, and that's the way it has to be. I think if you speak to any one of the, of the four engineers present and the other four, they're actually experts on architecture, they're experts in marketing, they're experts in landscape, they're experts in hydrology. One of the things that I think defines a new urbanist is actually that they're generalists. You know, the fact that you have Douglas, who is an expert in philosophy and who uh, uh, can also design very nitty gritty curbs uh, in, the, in the city shows the kind of thing we are. And by the way, people like Peter Swift have learned to draw as well as most architects. You know, so that is uh, what makes, I think, all of us special, but especially unusual in the engineering profession that I think has been taught to focus on only one thing in order to solve problems. Now, about this book, the first, when you finally open it and you've gotten through Emily Talens and everybody else's book, Aaron Ben Joseph's, you know, there's big piles of books. You realize, and your eyes, as I said, land anywhere, is that it is actually perfectly clear. At no point did my eyes land on any, on any sentence or paragraph that wasn't limpid, perfectly clear, and completely free of fluff and cant, which is unheard of in almost any field. And uh, it can communicate at the highest level and also to regular folk. And that's really an achievement. It is very, very easy to read. One of the things that makes it easy to read is that although there are, I think something like nine chapters, the chapters are subdivided into subsections that are rarely, rarely more than two pages long. And in these two pages, um, Lawrence just nails the subject. You know, he just gets it down, whether it's about a person or about a principle or about an event or about a theory. You read two pages and you say, I know exactly what that's about. Let's, you know, and so you get a constant feeling of satisfaction. And for some reason, you don't get the feeling of being overwhelmed, which is what happens when writing is dense. Somehow the writing is very dense, but it doesn't feel dense. It's almost miraculous in that way. There's a lightness to it that uh, just shows an extraordinary skill, okay? Now, um, that doesn't mean it isn't scholarly. Um, I have whole books on, or a book at least, on a topic that Lawrence covers in, in three pages, which is amazing. But the scholarly, the scholarship is extraordinary. At the rear, there are 50 pages a little bit over 50 pages of closely spaced notes and footnotes. You know, that's what went into it. I don't think there's anything has been left out. And if you want to look further, there it is. But there will be no need to look further because this is, this is what you need to know. It's, uh, in fact, if you look further, you might actually get confused by, by uh, people writing about simple things and overwhelming them by, by writing too much. Okay, now one thing that is rarely said, but Books these days give my, hurt my eyes, if not my teeth, okay? Uh, they're, they're, the books, the typography is too small. There's a fashion of making the ink gray. It's very, very hard. It's irritating to read most books. The other thing, and this is not, this is perfect. The typography, the layout, the spacing, everything is perfect. And even more unusual, all the illustrations of which there must be, I don't know whether a hundred or certainly more of a hundred, they've been put through a filter, a kind, of, a kind of gray filter that makes them compatible. So you don't get you know, black and white and then bright color and then a bad, uh, you know, a bad image of some kind. Everything has been kind of um, uh, produced into what in films is called continuity. The book has beautiful continuity. All the images show you exactly, you know, by this kind of gray filter, it shows you exactly what you need to know. You don't have to squint and you're not distracted by extraneous things. 
So although it is not a conventionally beautiful book, you know, the kind that have bleed photographs to the edges and, you know, different page colors, it's actually, at first appearance, it is actually quite a dull looking book, almost out of date, you know, something out of the 50s, but it's not. It's actually beautifully produced and just right if you want to read it and learn a lot. And I really admire that part because I find most books irritating uh, graphically. So it's beautifully produced. Uh, fifth, and this is something that comes through, you know, there are books that are written, let's say about food or some about paper clips or some about uh, the history of, uh, you know, climate change or the history of the hat. And through these very small apertures, these, um, these uh, authors uh, brilliantly managed to actually portray all of society. You know, everything about the society, about its concerns, its troubles, its aspirations, you know, and, uh, and um, it, they're kind of miraculous books. This book is like that also, okay? It, 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 yes, it is about street networks, but I think it's the worst thing about the book. I mean, the, probably the only bad thing is that the title doesn't do it justice. It's not about grids. It's about, it's about the entire of the idea of society through its movement system, so through its ability to move. And so what you learn uh, on the side is uh, you get a history of four centuries and more precise and a very precise history of two centuries uh, on society. So it isn't, I mean, you, you don't need to know anything or, be, or even care about, uh, about streets and grids and movement systems to just learn a huge amount about our world. And so I think of all the kind of small apertures through which people write books that are histories of society, I think this is one of absolutely one of the best and probably because because movement networks are in fact a very good a very good aperture to which to apply, uh, through which to approach now uh this book ha is has the characteristic of being a kind of assassin um there are books periodically that are written that obviate the need for any further book on the topic, like for example, a pattern language is probably the best known. But there have been other books, like if, for example, if you look at Raymond Unwin's Town Planning and Practice, there wasn't a need to publish another book as comprehensive as that one for a very long time. And uh, this one has that aspect. This is like an hourglass. You know, uh, all these grains of sand in the upper half, all the people and the ideas and the experiments and the aspirations, they come through this book and then at the end, it disaggregates. And after this, I don't think there will be a need. There may be a need for an appendix, Lawrence, as you, as we see how the next uh, 10 or 20 years come out, you know, with all the troubles we're about to have. And as we know, 21st century is a tough time, but uh, it may need an addendum. It might need a, an additional addition, but it will not need another, there will be no need for a further need for a comprehensive book on, on this kind of history. So by the way, on the side, you also get the history of urban planning. And I think one of the things that new urbanists don't know enough about, they really don't, they don't know enough about their own history, the history of urban planning. They're very practical, they're very, uh, uh, oriented to the current situation, and they really don't know, not even the professors particularly know where these ideas came from, that actually they didn't come, come out of nowhere. They were actually human beings that invented dendritic systems. They were human beings that invented the grid, that adjusted the grid, that adjusted the diagonals, you know, that, uh, that invented grade separation. There is a history, and that history is profoundly satisfying, and one of the things it does, and here's where it stands among, there, among uh, um, the many books of the new urbanism. There is a large number of books that are persuasive. For example, uh, or lecturers that are persuasive. For example, Joe Manicozzi is an extraordinarily persuasive lecturer. Suburban Nation, our book, was extraordinarily persuasive. Okay, so there's that. We have a lot of persuasion. One of the things I notice about our 
our conferences and congresses is we spend too much time persuading people that are already there because they're convinced. And then there's another kind of book, which is technical. The Calthorpe books have sometimes been technical. Certainly the smart code and the modules are technical. They tell you what to do. This is what you do, but they don't really explain why. This is that middle, a kind of missing middle that explains why. Okay, I think we should probably be getting to. Uh, yeah, I'm almost done. Between the persuasion, between the persuasion and the technical books, if you know why this happened, it'll give you the confidence to stand up for the ideas, because too many people buckle. Okay, because they don't know where it came from and they're overwhelmed. And this is the kind of book that sits in the middle and will let you give you the confidence to stand up to, to either technical people or uh, just political people. And that happens to be the last of my notes. So I'm gonna go on mute, right? Let me share my screen here. Thank you, Andres. Your praise and attention are extraordinary, maybe even over the top. And I thank you as sincerely as I can. Thanks also to Rob Studeville, Diru Tadani, and Leah Galagos for organizing the CNU Authors Forum series. It's a remarkable service for authors and readers alike. Okay, so uh, I've been writing about new urbanism for 20 years or so, and to me, one of the most interesting topics is the factors that impede or prevent new urbanism. Surveys find that 30 to as much as 60% of the US market prefers new urbanism, but only 10 to 25% of households reside in even slightly walkable neighborhoods. Lawrence, I can't hear and see your screen. Okay, let's see. on the bottom did you click on the share screen oh, i we am can, we can see him you can see can you see his screen oh no mm. yeah, i'm clicking on it hmm. leah do you have a suggestion Or maybe can you do it for him? No, I can't. I can't share his screen for him. Hmm. Did the person who started uh, allow all to share screens? It says uh, I might. I might need permission from the host. Yeah. And the host is Leah. Have you tried hitting your green button, Leah? We'll work this out in a minute for everybody out there. Lawrence, can you try again, please? I'm clicking on it, yeah. Sometimes there's a delay. No, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing. Um, he's, he's got permission. I could try logging out and logging back in. Maybe try to do that quickly. Um, okay. If you do that quickly, uh, I don't know if any of the folks <laughs> have anything to say or uh, while he's doing that. Uh, thoughts on Lawrence's book from anybody in the panel? 
One thing I was going to, I forgot to say is that uh, you should all click on Lawrence's homepage uh, to see not only what he's done, but how much useful stuff he has done that is still useful and that some of us don't even know about, which is, I didn't, it slipped past me. And uh, uh, so I think the homepage would be a really good, and it would, it's very enriching to look at it. There's a suggestion that um, the PowerPoint presentation be emailed to the host. Could be emailed to me and I could advance it. Um, okay. What's your homepage? We see you, Lawrence. Okay. Can you see my screen? I can now. I can see you. Hmm. You have to share the screen and then um, and then select a window. That would be uh, your presentation. There you go. Excellent. All right. Finally, Good. Uh, let's see. Going forward, surveys find that 30 to much as 60% of the US market prefers new urbanism, but only 10 to 25% of households reside in even slightly walkable neighborhoods. This means that in the US alone, the unserved market for new urbanism is tens of millions of households. Why is that? One set of obstacles is traffic planning regulations and customs having to do with roadway networks. Those rules make good design difficult or impossible. They perpetuate the widespread pattern of suburban sprawl roadway networks. Here's a few examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. These maps are from sprawlmap.org and the cul-de-sacs are colored in red. This is Boulder County, Colorado, outside the city of Boulder. Antioch, California in the San Francisco metropolitan area. And UK examples, suburban Belfast, Ireland. And Warrington, England, where a new town development surrounds the historic core. Although their details are somewhat different, these sprawl patterns are based on similar design principles. They are very difficult to retrofit and inhospitable to infill. And that is by design. So how did these patterns originate? We know that excessive traffic conflicts with roadway livability. The general thesis of my book is that city builders consistently used one basic idea to address that conflict, the separation of different types of traffic uh, from each other based on function. For example, freight traffic was separated from passenger traffic, through traffic was separated from local traffic, and so on. The various methods of traffic separation can be sorted, more or less naturally, into four themes, vertical separation, and in the horizontal dimension, divided, insular, and fast roadways. Vertical schemes began to appear in earnest soon after passenger rail was introduced, like this 1845 scheme for London. The idea was to bring railroad speed to city streets, which would relieve congestion and shorten commutes. Schemes like this one created multi-level urbanism with powered vehicles and pedestrian oriented frontages on multiple levels. They promised to spur business development, create new social spaces and provide architectural beauty. This 1891 scheme by the architect Alfred Thorpe may have been the first serious proposal for a citywide elevated roadway network. West Street in lower Manhattan was a critical bottleneck in America's transportation system, and its persistent congestion motivated many proposals from the 1860s to the 1920s. Thorpe's scheme served freight wagons on the ground level and trains on the second level. The third level would have new storefronts and a boulevard and promenade that he described as splendid. In 1925, Manhattan Borough President Julius Miller proposed a similar scheme, but he had to split it for political reasons. 
the rail element was mo moved a few blocks inland and became the High Line. The road element became the West Side Elevated Highway. This illustrates how pedestrian orientation was eliminated from this genre, and it transformed into elevated freeways. Divided roadways. From the 1600s to the 1800s in Europe, this type was often associated with elite recreation and social exclusion. This is the Avenue of the Empress in Paris around 1858. Baron Haussmann made a spur of the moment decision that the avenue should be 120 meters or 390 feet wide, the widest boulevard in the world at the time. The central travelway was divided into three lanes for equestrians, pedestrians, and the center for general traffic. During the reign of Napoleon III, the avenue became part of a daily ritual, a giant parade of carriages displaying the wealth and status of the city's elite. The avenue's divided lanes reinforced social stratification in Paris. Later designers had the goal of rationalizing chaotic traffic streams that contained many incompatible modes and vehicles. Frederick Law Olmsted designed this parkway for Beacon Street in Boston in 1886. It had dedicated space for five travel modes and was one of the first proposals for bicycle lanes on a city boulevard. Insular roadways are partially or totally withdrawn from general traffic circulation. They date from ancient times and were often motivated by a desire for protection, as well as social exclusion and status. For example, through most of the 19th century, many of London's privately managed neighborhoods had street barriers. They wanted to restrict offensive traffic types, ensure quiet, and insulate themselves from lower class districts. The city had as many as 300 barriers at any one time, but they were fought and eventually banned. Critics said they created lengthy, annoying detours and were unfair devices of elitist exclusion. In the US, Frederick Law Olmsted worried that business development would degrade his elegant residential suburbs. He believed that inconvenient street patterns would permanently suppress all neighborhood change. His plan for Riverside in 1869 illustrated his principles. On the side facing downtown Chicago, external connections were closely spaced. On the other sides, connections were one eighth as frequent, even where there were no natural barriers. This idea was later called the traffic island or cellular pattern. A network of high volume arterials forms the boundaries of residential cells. Inside the cells, street layouts discourage or block through traffic and the number of external connections is limited. Clarence Perry, an er educator and social ad activist was a leading popularizer of the cellular concept. In 1929, he declared, we are going to live in cells. The cellular city is the inevitable byproduct of an automobile age. The traffic engineering and land planning sectors took up the idea with alacrity. It promised a tantalizing combination of safe residential environments and high-speed vehicular movement. It offered a model for the automobile age that could structure suburbs and restructure cities. The US Federal Housing Administration issued powerful guidance like this extremely cellular plan. It was a neighborhood unit on 460 acres or 186 hectares, but it had only two external connections. Insularity from the surrounding roads and properties was nearly absolute. A subset of the cellular pattern is the dendritic or tree-like pattern. These patterns typically, typically consist of arterials which branch into collector streets, which branch into cul-de-sacs. Raymond Unwin, working in the early 1900s, made superblock and cul-de-sac layouts a signature element of garden city planning. He wanted to promote social intimacy, provide refuge from automobile noise, and reduce development costs. This plan for Hampstead Garden Suburb in London had superblocks up to a quarter mile long, 26 acres in area, with cut through pedestrian paths. Unwin's principles were extremely influential to UK development patterns and later trends like the Newtown's movement. Some schemes retrofitted existing grids into dendritic patterns. 
This 1933 proposal for Hastings Street in Detroit was intended to demolish a vital center of Black American business and culture in the name of slum clearance. The grid would be severed to form rows of cul-de-sacs and the main streets would be transformed into freeways and partially limited uh, access arterials. Elements of this plan were built later in the 1930s and the Chrysler Freeway replaced Hastings Street in the 1960s. Dendritic subdivision designs reached a tipping point in American architectural establishment in the 1940s. This 1946 plan from the Harvard Graduate School of Design anticipated the winding cul-de-sac patterns that would dominate American suburbs in the late, in the late 20th century. The plan aimed to provide healthy living closer to nature, jobs and daily needs within walking distance, and rapid unimpeded car travel. Most plans that were inspired by garden city planning, like this one, had superblocks with cut through footpaths. But the Urban Land Institute advised against cut through paths in the 1940s because of privacy and crime concerns. And they were generally rejected by the American housing market. They were much more prevalent in European countries, especially the UK and Denmark. Fast roadways, those intended for speed driving, had origins in the sport of horse trotting. Formal and informal races were held on park and suburban roads. And as traffic volumes increased in the late 19th century, racers pushed for exclusive facilities. The most famous was the Harlem River Speedway in Manhattan. Only fast carriages were allowed on the two and a half mile road. And it had iron railings and three underpasses to keep pedestrians off the road surface. You can see an underpass in the bottom corner of this picture. Horse carriage speedways established the legal and cultural precedents for high speed motor traffic in urban settings nationwide. The most advanced speedways barred all but a select class of vehicles, eliminated access to adjacent properties, banned at grade street intersections, and had high speed curvilinear geometry. Motor vehicle drivers began campaigning for similar roadways. Thomas McDonald, chief of the US Bureau of Public Roads for 34 years, established the guiding vision for the US interstate freeway system. By 1925, if not earlier, he believed that highways penetrating city centers were the most important traffic planning priority. Around the same time, starting in the 1920s, these four methods of traffic separation began to be sifted and blended. That was spurred by mass automobile ownership and the rise of the auto industry as a major political power. The blending of cellular planning and urban freeway planning was exceptionally successful after World War II. <coughs> I'll describe a few milestones in that process. In 1943, BPR chief Thomas McDonald informed the American Society of Civil Engineers that freeways and expressways would restructure cities according to the cellular principle. He said this remodeling into neighborhood cells was necessary for the survival of cities. An important tool to accomplish that remodeling was a policy called functional classification. The policy classified roadways into a few types to guide roadway design and administration. Its purpose was to concentrate funding and traffic on a relative few yet elaborate highways and arterials. Functional classification helped guide suburban development into cellular patterns. The policy was advanced by the auto industry, highway engineers, and the federal government in close partnership. A powerful group called the Automotive Safety Foundation led the corporate effort to mandate functional classification in the US. The group was entirely funded and directed by automakers and associated industries. From the 1940s to the 1960s, ASF was the leading purveyor of state and city traffic plans and classification schemes that determined the control, funding, and design of urban highways and arterials. This vision of urban freeways is from their first initiative in California in 1946. The planning sector also contributed to the push for cellular layouts. One of the largest planning efforts of the 1950s, the Chicago Area Transportation Study, said that urban freeway networks were required 
in order for the cellular pattern to work at all. Otherwise, the bounding arterioles would be overloaded with longer distance traffic. This diagram from the study showed how existing grids could be obstructed to create cellular layouts. The, Ch the Chicago study was a model for the 1962 Federal Highway Act, which required metropolitan area planning. So there was this tight linkage between the cellular pattern, freeways, and auto dependency. The auto companies were well aware of this, and that was one reason they supported functional classification so strongly. This emblem was created by ASF to show the changes that functional classification would bring to urban areas, from the older walkable city centers to progressively more sprawling and disconnected roadway patterns in the outer suburbs. ASF, state highway engineers, and their allies finally got functional classification mandated in the US in 1973. Their efforts had lasting impacts on US roadway patterns. From 1980 to 2017, urban freeway mileage more than doubled and urban arterial mileage increased 80%, both outpacing urban population growth. America's new roadway networks became more sprawling and disconnected, just as ASF had pictured. In recent decades, America's new street networks have been some of the most disconnected in the de developed world. And in terms of extent, America stands far beyond the rest. No other country has as much disconnected street network sprawl. That has enormous consequences for America's quality of life because disconnected street networks are correlated with more driving, more car pollution, and more life years lost to crash injuries and fatalities. The neo-traditional urban design movement arose in the 1960s and 1970s to counter the worst aspects of status quo urban planning, and it aimed to reduce the extremes of traffic separation. The St. Lawrence neighborhood near downtown Toronto was designed in 1975-1976 and was the first neo-traditional neighborhood to be built. 60% of its dwellings were affordable, and it was a pioneering example of brownfield infill. The traffic plan kept the through streets that crossed the freeway on the southern border, and it added interior loops that formed extra small blocks. The plan was a conscious rejection of auto-oriented superblock and ring road planning. It was intended to promote connections and building variety and engage with the surrounding community and historical context. The La Villette project for Paris was a 1976 competition entry by Leon Creer. It was the first neo-traditional plan to gain international recognition. At first glance, this looks like a simple grid, but note the width of the bordering avenues. They indicate the scale of the plan. The blocks were tiny. The streets were very narrow. Most had one travel lane, and even the main axial thoroughfare had only two travel lanes. Half the streets were car free or car limited and a bordering boulevard served as a bypass route for through traffic, curving along the top here. Creer said that compact mixed use neighborhoods, similar to this, were the only solution to urban traffic problems. All the early neo-traditional projects demonstrated ways to tame cut through traffic. None had simple grids extending in all directions. And that was one of the elements that distinguished traditional urban design from neo-traditional. In conclusion, I believe that an understanding of street network history can help urban designers and advocates win the argument for better street networks. Another thing that could help is a consensus among urban designers about the meaning of better, because there is little guidance available to new urbanism, new urbanism practitioners about cellularity. We have several excellent resources that explain why street connectivity is recommended and beneficial but we have no in-depth guidance about the recommended degree of cellularity in a range of contexts or case studies, performance evaluations, and so on. I hope that my book will direct more attention to street network design in general and help remove impediments to new urban plans and retrofits. Thank you for listening. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to the panel discussion.
I'll jump in here. Thanks, thanks, Lawrence. Um, I um, really enjoyed working with you on the on the rainwater initiative, and in fact, the the article that you wrote, dense and beautiful stormwater management, was so comprehensive and complete that it pretty much um, ended our our efforts. It was it wrote the book on it and uh, it was a done deal. So um, very good work on that. Um, one, one, one of the things that I've been fascinated about on, on, on this subject is the virtuous goals of the, of the you know, planning leaders of the 20s and 30s, like Clarence Stein, um, I particularly got fascinated with him um, with his Radburn and then uh, Baldwin Hills Village, which he said was the ultimate culmination of the Radburn ideas. And I spent a day there and it's a beautiful park setting with um, very tall sycamore trees. And I spent a couple hours there on a Saturday and I saw two people in that beautiful park setting. And I walked around the block and it was all um, backs of houses. There was, and then there was a separated parking lot that required um, security forces to walk people to their units. And then there was a, a strip uh, shopping center with parking in front. And um, I was just fascinated how his goals were so virtuous and he was so certain that he had solved the problem of, of the automobile. And it's sort of, I think, a cautionary tale for us that um, really demands self-criticism and some humility about um, our virtuous goals. Yeah, thanks. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, that, that's a, a theme I see over and over, people focusing on small scale and, and, and missing the forest for the trees, not, not seeing the, the larger scale impacts. So, you know, providing uh, great environments on, on uh, a particular cul-de-sac, but not paying attention to the arterial next door that, that is the result. Oh, this is Rick Hall. I, I totally agree with Paul on the on the uh, the virtuous nature of many of these thought leaders through history. Um, but this book, Lawrence, uh, there, there's such a rich history here for us to observe that we can consider those um, uh, fine ideas and, and the fine motivation of each of the individuals. Yet we can see when the results went sour and why they went sour. Um, the, uh, I, I like the idea that you gave Jane Jacobs four pages. That's beautiful. I learned that Jane Jacobs used to work in the propaganda business for the US government during World War II. So um, Robert Moses Oops. didn't have a chance. <laughs> Robert, Robert Moses had no chance that um, uh, going up against her. Um, and, and, and she, uh, you say, was a modernist. She was supporting all the modernist ideas of urban renewal and, and, uh, and freeways until she walked some of the uh, neighborhoods that, were, that had faced urban renewal and saw the cultural disaster that that was uh, putting forward. So thanks for that history. Chapters one through seven are the rich history. Chapters eight, nine, and 10 are our experience, and you've documented that so well. Um, so uh, I tell you, here's, here's my pronouncement on the book. Um, until the transportation engineers all study history from this book, uh -huh. the shift will not occur. Yeah. The shift will not occur until all the transportation engineers study from this book and, and a few others, but mainly this book. And, and then their eyes will open. There will be a paradigm shift 
and, and oh, they say, oh, you mean we are the modernists? We are the functionalists uh, in this ball game? So thank you again for that. Real quickly, your recommendations are beautiful. You say, study the history, fear the freeways, be cautious with the cellular patterns, and review the past solutions. They're, they may have come back around. But finally, know the history before we can advance. Very well written, very well summarized on the last page. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Thank you, Rick. Uh, that's amazing for you to say, very kind. Um, I don't know if it's the last word. I don't know if it's the only word. I, I would say no, and absolutely not. It's, it's not the last or the only word. Uh, uh, but but I'm, uh, I'd be more than happy j just to make a good contribution. So, um, Lawrence, I would like to amplify that last point you made um, about the fact that this is absolutely not the last word. I think this history is so rich and so fascinating. And it, it, the, this, the, the um, le lessons from it are so numerous including understanding where ideas came from, but also understanding what happens when ideas get morphed from, what, from the beginning point to the end. A, a lot of what seems to fail in some of these ideas is what gets left out in the implementation phase. Um, so the last point you ended up with is the need to really understand at a citywide level, at a um, regional level, how different systems work. And I think there's still so much work to be done on that, um, that this is definitely, there needs to be a lot of work done. The history is gonna help us get there, but I don't know if I, I, I agree with Rick in saying that um, this is gonna change any minds in the um, engineering community. Uh, yes, I agree that engineers need to know their history, but I don't see it necessarily changing how things get done until we start to recognize that what we are trying to do is not just about moving vehicles. And that is not the only thing that we are being paid for, but we are being paid to make communities. Mm -hmm. I think that is the recognition that is really lacking from how governance from how the professional organizations from how the engineering acts so that idea of bringing all of these bits together and understanding at the center of city making is how we deal with movement i think if we don't get to that point then i don't see um the, this utopia that rick um is seeing in in, in looking at the history so you would say necessary, but not sufficient. Not sufficient at all. <laughs> I agree. May, may, I, may I just add, add one thing to this? There are mechanisms in the United States, there always have been to secede from things that don't work. And we're very aware of people who leave the urban areas for suburban areas. We're aware of people who leave England and arrive in New England and people who leave the Northeast and go to the, to go to the Sun Belt. We know that we can secede. The great mechanism we have is the homeowners association, you know, which actually allows you to write your own rules and the PUD, the PUD being the physical and the homeowners association being the administrative. They have never been fully used for pilot projects. And we used to use them, you know, DPZ was very good at, 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 uh, at using that platform. What has been happening over the years and very quickly is that the engineers have grabbed hold of the standards outside the PUD, right? Out, the, the, the PUD we're supposed to release us from and homeowners association. And now the standards apply within these experimental platforms. You know, if the PUD could be restored to its original intention back in the 1970s when they were written and the homeowners associations in the eighties we could actually posit utopias and experiment. And so perhaps the first step would be to push back and say, give us back the authentic PUD and, and uh, property owners association. So I, I actually have a point to make about that. Um, the, the 
charter of the CNU talks about regional and regional planning and regional uh, regional planning, but we almost never engage at that level as as a organization. And really, I think that is fundamental to the changes we are talking about here, because we are talking about patterns of movement that are fundamentally at regional scales. And if we don't start to engage there, then we are setting up ourselves for failure. Yes, we're going to have nice pockets of urbanity, but we're never going to have functional com um, community on a regional scale. Right. Do you know uh, the 15 minute city, which is now so popular, uh, we've been studying it with a Rob and uh, the 15 minute walk, the 15 minute bike, the 15 minute electric vehicle, neighborhood electric vehicle and the 15 minute truck give us the basis for that regional planning. We just never had, we only had the five minute pedestrian shed that's been part of our problem, okay? And the, we only had the 15 minute pedestrian shed. We never had the 15 minute automobile shed. Do you know how many people live in a 15 minute automobile shed or even an EV vehicle? 1.4 million. With an electric, an electric bike can reach 1.4 million people at a, um, uh, in 15 minutes at, at 20 miles an hour. And that might be the basis that would allow us to engage this because it's, it's in our DNA, it's in our method, in our system. And perhaps that's the next step for new urbanism. To get off, I agree. Is getting off the pedestrianism and saying, what do cars do? What do electric vehicles do? What about that 1.4 million people that we can actually bicycle to? It's interesting. And what about the commuter rail? Well, the commuter rail actually is overly liberating. What I found when I diagrammed it is that, you know, if you can say, well, Paris, um, Paris has, has a very dense network of commuter rail. Basically, it destroys the discipline. That's what's interesting about it. You know, when you, when you draw it, you know, the, everything can be anywhere. The hospital can be anywhere uh, within huge regions, within regions of six and 10 million people. And so I actually, the commuter rail destroys that discipline. Douglas. Not well, uh, Douglas. Can't hear very well. You sound like a Martian. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you, what do you think it is? I had one, one reaction to uh, Norman's comment, which was um, there's a lot of proposals for uh, uh, blocking off streets, uh, low traffic neighborhoods, uh, putting in diverters. Um, and uh, that, that's not the only way to reduce uh, traffic um, uh, volumes. If, if a community is looking to reduce uh, traffic volumes to to improve livability. There's also policy solutions, um, uh, emissions charges, congestion charges, uh, limited traffic zones. Uh, those are the kinds of things that that need to be um, conceived and and discussed and implemented on the regional scale. So that's that's all a part of regional governance. So I just wanted to jump in here and say that we're almost at the one hour mark. And then we're going to continue this discussion. I wanted to remind everybody who's watching uh, that uh, you can ask questions in the Q and A using the Q and A format of Zoom. And that um, if people have to leave now, uh, we're going to be posting the uh, uh, the video, uh, you know, within about a day or so, and everybody can see the answers. Uh, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll continue for for about another half an hour or so on this discussion. Uh, if we get enough questions from the audience. Um, uh, so uh, we can, um, um, I don't know if anybody has any kind of last thoughts on this, uh, on the, uh, the panel discussion right now. Yeah, I'd like to, to throw in one last idea, um, uh, Robert. Um, 
Rob, the the idea of context, context. Um, Andres introduced the transect to us, one through six. Um, I remember being in the room when that first uh, was was uh, discussed. And then Florida DOT has come up as a state DOT with eight classifications. And they are using those classifications to determine how to design the streets within each one. And every mile of uh, highway in the state of Florida that they own, uh, each has a clear classification and their design manual has been rewritten to emphasize those areas of context. So we can be urban and design urban, be rural and design rural. And I think the, the evolution of that is in addition to this history that, uh, uh, that, we, that, that we have in the book uh, will combine to give us a surge forward. Uh, Lawrence, have you seen that classification system from Florida? And, and what do you think about that? I have seen it. It's, it's a, Florida is one of the leading states in this, in this field of um, context-related uh, traffic planning. Uh, there's there's only a few states that ha, had a, that have made such progress, uh, and they really should be commended for uh, what they're attempting to do, what they're uh, striving for. Um, I don't know how it's been implemented. Uh, I'd like to learn more about that, uh, the the outcomes. Um, but so far, it looks good. Lawrence, can could you all hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. There was a little, obviously, a technical issue uh, that caught me because I'm on phone and in computer. Listen, the, the book is splendid. I, I don't know if we have any time. Do we have enough time for any yeah. other comments? Yeah, sure. Um, go right ahead. Really? Are you sure? Yes. Well, the book is, the, the book is, is well, I have a category in which what books will be read in the next century and yours made that great, which is very, very, very few. You really have an extraordinary achievement period. It's extraordinary. Okay. So a critique of your book involves the, the actual maze of the intellects that have been trying to figure out the traffic problem. In other words, it's an intellectual book about intellectual theory. And I want to do a meta theoretical critique of it, if I may use that incredibly heavy word. Okay. Which is if the source is a perfect compendium of all the theory that has been cooked up and practiced, by traffic engineers and people concerned with traffic, the critique has to develop by looking at actual human ecology and human habitat in its original patterns, because they're always transformed. In other words, a super block or a penetrated super block becomes, is not a block of blocks in a traditional city. And there are you know, any number of examples that follow this. One of the ways that you can cut the Gordian knot is happened in the last red, which is only a few months ago, in which I realized that people were talking thinking they were doing a pedestrian scheme, but couldn't stop talking about cars. How many charrettes have you been in, in which everybody advances pedestrianism? And 97% of all the talk and actual design is based on car talk. Do you see what I mean? So we're really talking about a gravity well. We're talking about a black hole. And the black hole may actually be, which is why it's meta-theoretical, it, it may be, your book may be a companion of tech, technical reasoning. You see what I mean? So what can be the basis of a critique of technical reasoning? And it can only be human ecology in its natural patterns, whether you study Islam or an ancient historic city or go to Nepal, things like that. And that may be the actual critique of the car, you know, because in reality, the cities that are best loved then have capacity for 15 minutes increments are actually retrofit for the car. In other words, you have a mountain village or you have a, uh, an Indian city that was not designed with car movement, but just with bare supply market movement in mind, and it's retrofitted for the car. In other words, the city itself and its patterns, which are complex, are the actual critique of traffic engineering and engineering thinking. And I'm sure it's not all over your head, but it's it's a new it's another departure point on your book. And as you have exhausted 
the compendium of technical thinking. You see what I mean? You've given us a, the core history of technical thought. And the question really becomes is what is not technical thought? What are natural organic patterns seen throughout history in all cities? From which in new urbanism, a lot of people have derived a lot of input. And why can't we study it? And why do fish really not talk about water? Is how I would put it. For fish to talk about water, there has to be uh, reason and abstraction enough that you can develop technical solutions. You know, but what is the habitat of the fish? You say. So that's what remains. What is not technical? Because a technical answer may just caught us, catch us within another subset of maze. And the real question is: Can technical reasoning actually? <laughs> Okay, we, uh, we can't hear you, Douglas. Uh, just, just dropped out. Douglas, why are you so high tech? That it's completely. Why do you have to have so many things going at the same time that we can't hear you? No, but that's that's an excellent point. Uh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Douglas. Douglas, stop talking. Yeah. Hey, um, I, Douglas, one way to do about, to, to think about this is Havana is a very interesting, um, um, is a very interesting lab. We were both there at a very interesting time back in 96, I think. Havana was originally the kind of city, especially old Havana and Centro Havana was the kind of city Douglas is talking about, which is structured, you know, that began prior to the tech and then the cars came in and it was somewhat retrofitted. But then what happened was there was a complete economic collapse. And when we arrived there, uh, there was, first of all, they, they, they were back to horses, which was delightful, you know, with little bells. Uh, everybody was tanned and everybody was fit and slim. And you said, well, this really works. This is amazing, you know, the, the great economic break when Russia gave up on Cuba. But then what happened is they, they, the cars came back. So what do we do about that? As soon as there was an economy, the cars came back. And uh, that's what totally defeats me, is the reversion of the car, even when circumstances are perfect. One, one thing that I've gotten interested in uh, lately is the sprawl patterns of low income and developing countries, because they're very different from uh, the Anglo-American, European type of sprawl. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the, the social, cultural, institutional factors that, that cause those differences mm -hmm. and what kind of prospects they have for retrofitting uh, compared to our more formal and planned type of sprawl that we have in, in uh, Anglo-American countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Um, is uh, what, what can we do to get Connecticut cities back on track there? A poster child for urban abuse, uh, for the motoring and metastasis, the sprawl, um, largely because of the former humane pattern is still there, but thoroughly compromised or under leveraged. Uh, meanwhile, the parking garages keep going up in places like Hartford and Bridgeport, the cities, they're a wreck. <laughs> any, any thoughts on a place like Connecticut? May I, may I say one thing? One of the best books I've read on American urban history is a book on New Haven, actually. And it gave, it's one of these aperture books that, uh, that uh, lead to the whole, the whole history of urbanism. And one of the things I remember is that the corner stores, quote unquote, corner stores disappeared two decades, began to disappear two decades before the advent of the automobile. And the theory, the theory of the author, who was a Yale professor, was that as soon as factory work stopped being quite so miserable, says a lot of people that operated corner stores where they did it for food, just to get less expensive food, they were not profitable, but they were better than working at the dark satanic mills, you know, uh, seven and a half days a week. And when the union movement actually fixed it, began to fix that circumstance, people went to the factories. And so I bring up, um, I bring up Paul's analysis of Radburn, 
and why it didn't work. An early analysis is that the front doors give to the park, the front doors of the houses give to the park and the rear or kitchen doors give to the cul-de-sacs. And since 90% of American arrivals are through the kitchen, then no one actually thinks of going out the front door to the park. Everybody goes out the back door. And I think it's these very subtle human things that Douglas often talks about, like what's the human factor? Because the failure may not be what we think. You know, it might be something like the advent, of, you know, they just got the back and front door backwards or the advent of television or whatever, you know? I have a very different take on um, the Connecticut urban, urbanism. There is now a group by a colleague of mine from the law school. She's also an urban planner, um, Sarah Bronin. And she started last summer a group called Desegregate Connecticut. And what we see in Connecticut is urbanism built around racism is what I would describe it. Um, all of our so-called cities, um, Hartford, Connecticut with 128,000 people is almost entirely black or Hispanic. Um, we just had, we have been working on a project looking at TODs. And one of the issues that come up is that white people, this, we were told this by a developer, white people in Connecticut do not ride on buses. Um, in Connecticut, the term city, it means a place where poor minorities live. Mm -hmm. So the patterns that we see in Connecticut are so intertwined with how people see the state from a economic and from a um, racial point of view that I think to start changing patterns in Connecticut, we're going to have to deal with those issues of how we see ourselves from a racial point of view. Yeah. Yep. You have a question um, about functional classification for Lawrence. Um, and uh, uh, um, it says that uh, if functional classification systems are very hard to retrofit, do separated bike paths, retrofitting declining shopping centers and e-bikes offer any ho hope? They offer hope. Um on a, on a, a, a scale basis uh, for, for retrofitting individual uh, neighborhoods and sites. Um, there's less hope uh, from, those specific, from those specific strategies. There's less hope for um, reforming entire systems that might help um, regional transit and, um, and uh, bike connectivity. Um, kind of see this this in um, the the response in London, the uh, low traffic neighborhoods in London. They've been um, implemented on sort of a well, they're, they're tactical urbanism. Um, I can I, I have a, a map that shows all the uh, low traffic neighborhoods in the city, and there's no overall coordination. It was never conceived that way. Um, and they've been very controversial. Um, some of them have been overturned. Um, contrast that to uh, Barcelona, which uh, is, is planning on a much more uh, systemic uh, uh, system of, of uh, A and B streets, sort of a tartan grid, uh, much more attention to uh, multiple networks uh, serving different modes, different purposes and probably likely to be much more successful. So um, I guess th that's the thoughts I have. Uh, I would just say that, uh, you know, uh, continue to ask questions in the Q&A function of Zoom. I had a question. Um, there was a study that came out uh, fairly recently, just a few months ago, uh, by a, uh, a professor at, at um, USC called Jeff, um, named Jeff Boeing. And uh, it looked at uh, uh, the street networks around the country uh, since about 1940 to the present day. And he concluded that street networks were making a comeback. I don't know if, Lawrence, if you've seen this study, but um, his conclusions were that the connectivity since 2000 was on a significant increase across the United States uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, have you seen it? And what do you think of that? 
Yeah, the, I've seen several studies like that. I've seen that one. And um, they say that uh, the US disconnected street networks in the US reached a peak in the 1990s and they've been becoming uh, more connected since then, which is great news. We're making progress, but we're still one of the worst. Um, different different uh, studies come up with different actual relative numbers according to how they define connectivity. Uh, some say we've only made a little bit of progress. Some say we're all the way back to where we were in the 1950s, like Jeff Lowings. Um, it just depends on how they define connectivity. Um, so I, again, I think a, a major issue is the systemic thinking. Uh, we can improve connectivity within developments, uh, but if it's something like that FHA plan that I showed, uh, then that's not really getting us towards uh, urbanism and functional um, uh, traffic networks and bike, biking networks kind of things that we'd like to promote. Uh, Lawrence, this is Rick again. The I, I believe context is the number one issue. We will never have street networks uh, improved on their own by greater connectivity, greater narrowness, lower speeds. It's always going to have to come from the kind of neighborhoods that people uh, want and know and love. And then the streets will be subordinate. They will be secondary to the determination of the kind of neighborhood uh, and, and urban patterns that we like. We, we uh, new urbanism um, should really branch into the hopes and fears of, of, of the, the citizens. They ride in cars because they like the idea of going far with little fear. Okay, it's fear of uh, negative impacts, negative interactions with other people. And the, the racism uh, just charges in on, on that kind of a problem. And uh, so we've got to solve the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the impacts of racism on the patterns that we, that we have institutionalized. Uh, but we need to study what, what the fears are before we can get enough people comfortable with the other modes of transportation. Um, um, um. Rick, this other people comfortable. One of the things about new urbanists is we engaged very, very early in the public process, public participation. And remember there was Jane Jacobs did a bit, Charlie Moore did a bit, but we really made it central. And I think we need to, you know, as generalists, we need to understand that it isn't just the market that's preventing policy from happening. It's actually the public process, the NIMBY. There is progress being done and let me just say why this got brought up. Douglas and I grew up in Barcelona. And when we were there in the 70s, Francisco Franco put enormous parking garages underneath every single one of those wide avenues in Barcelona. Just from top to bottom, they were dug up for years. Paseo de Gracia, Avenida you know, uh, Diagonal and so forth. So Barcelona has an enormous amount of parking underneath the boulevards within very close walking distance of many of the buildings. And so when we study how Barcelona did it, we need to understand the, 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 the kind of top-down political process that did that. There was a dictator who said, this is happening now. And he did it so quickly that no, the world didn't even notice. Right now, we have the problem of the NIMBY, who will actually, is actually getting stronger through the internet. My life is miserable now because of the internet and the, uh, the, the way that the NIMBYs are able to actually load up any, any process. Now, we need to study this, of course, in a democracy, this is happening. There's a professor at Yale, a French woman called Delamore, that is actually dealing with the absence of democracy that that represents and is now helping to write the constitution of both Iceland and uh, Norway. Uh, so that that kind of thing cannot happen, you know, so that the part public participation is random, because I do believe most people will back what we're proposing here, but not in the public process as currently constituted, which just a few people can gate community. So as generalists, 
we need to look further and further to what's going to make this possible and not just the physical or the technical, but also the political. We have a question on the 15 minute city uh, uh, that uh, the 15 minute city embodies the new urbanism almost completely, but this is the first time that these principles have been on the minds of more people globally than ever before. And we shouldn't miss this opportunity. Uh, beyond uh, the 15 minute cities uh, projects that we've heard about, uh, what else is brewing on this idea? Maybe uh, I think the 15 minute city idea relates or came out certainly, um, it was popularized most, um, most strongly by the mayor of Paris. And that grew out of efforts to reclaim, to start to reclaim the streets first for buses and then for bike, people on bikes. Um, Paris is, to me, is a fascinating city because it is such an auto oriented city, but it is so admired by so people. I have always found this so amazing that you go to this place that is so admired and you choke on pollution and you can't cross the street. And Paris has spent the last, the mayor of Paris has spent the last 15 years trying to change that paradigm. And growing out of that in a more holistic way is this idea that really what we need to be doing is getting people to get, be able to get around without using cars. And so the 15 minute city is related to this idea of reclaiming the city. And that's another part of the story that is becoming much more current, even in a place like Milan, um, Italy, which, has, which went down a totally different rabbit hole over the last 50 years. So yes, I, I think those two ideas together are two very strong ideas that we can build on as a movement. What is the, what is the Milan model you refer to? Uh, well, Milan is um, like a lot of Italian cities, also large streets, um, very, very auto dependent. But Milan actually used the um, pandemic as an excuse to, um, to start reclaiming um, city space. Um, they started out with um, tactical urbanism type um, pattern, but then they um, proclaimed that they would make it more permanent. Just repeat some uh, some things that I've read that that compare the amount of political difficulty uh, for a policy compared to how much uh, benefit it delivers. And and uh, one report that I read just uh, today was saying the best trade off is uh, allocating more more space for uh, for people and and um, active transportation, reallocating street space. Um, there, there's lots of policies possible, but when you start getting into things like congestion fees, uh, it's, it's very politically difficult, technically difficult. Allocating street space is uh, uh, the best bang for the buck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question about Hyperloop. I don't know if you are familiar with this, uh, Lawrence, mm. um, but uh, you know, I guess really high tech uh, transportation solutions um, high-speed rail, uh, um, you know, things that, that aren't um, like building off of the railroad, building off of the old style railroads in terms of connecting us up in, in, the, in the 21st century. I did get into high tech some when I talked about vertical separation in my book. <clears throat> and that's one reason uh, vertical separation now, at least in terms of multi-level urbanism, uh, it's 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 science fiction. It's it just hasn't happened. Uh, you, you maybe look at uh, Wacker Drive in Chicago, one of the only actual built examples. Um, it just hasn't happened because it's the challenges are too high, the costs are too high, uh, the, the coordination, the the, the political um, uh, power that would be required. Um, so. Uh, they make they make good stories. Uh, the media loves these pictures, but uh, in terms of um, actually delivering something something that's viable and feasible, I, I'm not convinced. 
So we are, um, we're now an hour and 25 minutes. Um, I don't know if, if folks have any uh, final thoughts on, uh, on street networks and uh, where we go from here and, and, and you know, what are the interesting ideas? What, what may we have missed over the last uh, hour, and, hour and a half? When, uh, one thing, uh, there's a companion book that is almost of the same quality and it's very intimately related which is Eran Ben Joseph's book on parking, okay? And I think they're very intimately related. For example, I, um, Liz and I have a summer house in France that allows cars everywhere, but parking nowhere. And that, except in one boulevard, and that solves an enormous amount of uh, the, the, the traffic. So basically the deliveries, the emergencies, the cold weather days, the 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 rain days the kids that are, that can't walk you know a mile are solved because the cars can approach the houses but they can't park and so they don't blow out the urban fabric and they incentivize the use of pedestrianism because the car's too far away to go to it so as you leave your front door instead of going to your convenient car you go to your convenient walkable street and so the solution i've always thought that might be led with how parking is managed. And so I think Aaron's, Aaron Ben Joseph's book is a fantastic companion to this and it's also historical. Rob, there's another book that you may even wanna consider for uh, future uh, parts of the series. It's called Unplanning, Livable Cities and Political Choices, Charles Siegel. Um, he does a, a masterful job of the history, not as not as well as uh, um, Lawrence has done, but he's, he recommends two things. You limit the size of development that a developer can undertake and you limit the speeds to 15 or 20 miles per hour in the city. Hmm. You do those two things, limit the speeds and limit the size of development. And he says, he, he complains that we have too much planning, that it's the overregulation that's causing all the difficulty. Yeah. So he says, drop the regulations, just go with those two principles. Interesting. It's a great idea. That's that uh, un Unplanning by Charles Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L. I think that rings true. Yep. Okay, at this point, I would like to thank everybody. Man, thank you, Lawrence, uh, for uh, coming on and, and uh, talking about your book. Uh, clearly, a lot of enthusiasm for, um, for, for your book. Um, and um, uh, and all the panelists, uh, Andreas, Norman, Douglas, Paul, Rick, uh, and uh, Duru again for helping to organize this. Um, and uh, we will we will uh, post this video on uh, the CNU website uh, uh, later on this week. And so I wanted to thank everybody and and uh, uh, wish everybody a, a good day. And hey, Rob, I think we should um, congratulate our, our viewers. We had people from Germany, Malaysia, uh, uh, England, all over the world on this conference. It's just amazing. So thank everybody for joining. Yes, and putting up with some of the technical difficulties. Thank you to the, the panel of uh, engineers, uh, all of whom have taught me so much and contributed to this book just by, by uh, your activism and your, um, your, your research and your efforts. So thank you. Okay, goodbye everybody. Thank everybody. you. Adios. Adios, adios. Nice to see everybody. <laughs> <laughs>